quite a bit to cover, but also maybe less than last week. I felt like last week I overdid it. So I simplified this down to just one major point with the exception that I do want to recap where we kind of rushed through um, last week. So we're talking about the, the five like key fundamentals as we're building this theology of worship. And last week we talked about quality and excellence and creativity, and we didn't really get to spend a lot of time on the creativity portion. So I wanted to just hit that real quick before we move on uh, to the next section. Did anybody have any questions about kind of the excellence discussion and how we sort of handled that? We handled it with mediocrity, we handled it with mediocrity right? <laughs> Not with excellence. <laughs> <laughs> Mediocrities. I need to add that to the slide. That was good. Um, but yeah, so in a nutshell, our theology of worship, our understanding of excellence is that it is the striving for the excellence rather than achieving something that is perfect. Uh, because we can't, it's impossible for us to achieve the kind of excellence that Christ deserves, that God deserves. We can't do it. Uh, and so in that striving, in that effort to be better than we once were and to sacrificially do our best for the Lord, that is what is acceptable worship before God. Um, so we didn't get to spend a ton of time on creativity, so let me hit this for just a minute, and then we'll move on to the next point. But creativity is an important piece of this uh, quality section that we talk about in our understanding of worship and that creativity is a gift of the Creator. It's modeled by Him in creation. Um, he is the supreme creative force, and so it makes sense that He would be honored by us reflecting that creativity back to Him. Uh, throughout the Psalms, we read the repeated call to sing a new song, and that means exactly what it sounds like. It means sing something new. And that doesn't mean that we have to throw away our old songs um, it really is just an encouragement to uh, have this new expression of something new when we sing to him. And so it's, it's a call to write new songs. And that doesn't mean that every song that we write is meant for everyone. Uh, it can mean that we write a song that's just for us, that we sing our heart song when we worship the Lord, and that's okay. Um, so I'm not going to dig into those, but just spoiler alert, they all say, sing a new song. <laughs> um, worship songwriting is not for the pros, it's for the redeemed. And what I mean by that is that uh, God has given all of us things that are worth singing about and worth rejoicing over. So I don't mean that I expect all of you to come with lyrics and a chord chart and a lead sheet and like have new songs ready to go. What I mean by that is that in your, even in your quiet time, uh, even as you're just reading through scripture, uh, try, just try singing. And I don't mean like, you. obviously I think a lot of us like sing actual written, pre-written songs and hymns and things that are new, things that are very old, and I think that's great. Um, but try just reading through the Psalms and putting uh, notes to them. And it can be uh, happy sounding, it can be minor, it can be minor key and kind of sad sounding depending on how you're feeling. Uh, it can be off key, <laughs> it can be pitchy, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I would encourage you to just try that sometime. It's not something that's just for songwriters. Um, I think we, or musicians even, I think we kind of, um, because we have, like we talked about a few weeks ago, because we have created this multi-million dollar genre around worship music, we've made this big machine of it, that it can seem intimidating. Um, but, you know, David wasn't getting royalty checks for his psalms. You know, he never saw a penny for it. Uh, I don't even think David knew when he was writing these things down that they would be preserved for us. I, my hunch is that uh, God did not give him a glimpse that uh, we would be singing his words for millennia. Um, my hunch is that he thought this is just the way that I, as a young, uh, creative Hebrew, am going to worship my God. And I think that's an appropriate way for us to approach Scripture. Um, another thing is that it can even just be the way that we write down uh, words. If you journal, 
I'm, I'm terrible at journaling. I, I should do it more than I do. But when I do, a lot of times I'll just sit down and just write out praises to God. They don't rhyme. They don't have any kind of meter. Um, but I think that still gets at the heart of what, what David is encouraging us to do when he says to sing a new song. It's just to express in new ways your joy, your thankfulness, your rejoicing for the Lord, or your mourning, your lamenting, your lamentations, whatever it is, to put that into words. Um, I think it's good for all of us to try. Besides newness, creativity also brings diversity um, with each person that brings new things to the table and new songs, uh, they bring their backgrounds with them, their stories with them, their influences with them. Um, you know, I, I think we've talked about how Angeline and I grew up in the same denomination, but very, very different cultural expressions of worship. And that influenced both of us in good ways. And I think... Um, when I went to Baltimore and got to be part of her church for six years, seven years, whatever it was, um, I m learned so much about worship just from the different cultures that were represented there. We had, um, gosh, I don't know, probably like 60% were first-generation African immigrants uh, who come with a very different background. What's funny is a lot of them like come with like, like, they're very, like, uh, heavily influenced by old hymns because that's what the missionaries brought to Africa forever ago, and so that's what they look to as, like, worship music, and they're not interested in the modern stuff. It's really funny. Um, but even just their approach to music and, you know, like, we had, um, I think of Miss Etta, who, like, would sneak into the music room and steal a tambourine, <laughs> like, in the middle of worship. You know, that didn't happen in, like, cornfield, Illinois. Like, it just wasn't a thing that we did. It was much more rigid. And so, as we grow and encourage people to express creativity in worship, with that comes this broader spectrum of ways that we can worship. Um, I am, like, heavily influenced by folk music and singer-songwriters, um, but people elsewhere in our worship team are, have very different influences than that, and that's a great thing because they bring those things to the table. They uh, express that creativity in the way that they play, in the way that they sing. Um, so that's something that we encourage, and, and it helps us grow, and I think is a foreshadow of ultimately when every tribe, every tongue is expressing their glory for the Lord. We have this we begin to see that. We don't want it to be pigeonholed into one person's style or influence. Um, and God-honoring creativity is far more than just music. Uh, music is not the only way that we can honor the Lord with our creativity. Um, Jerome, Jerome Bars, uh, I've referenced this book before, and if you're at all interested in how God views creativity, or how God can use creativity, I definitely recommend Echoes of Eden. But he says, man and woman, God's image bearers, are made to be sub-creators following after their creator. The God who made all things made us to exercise dominion under him over this good creation. We exercise dominion now by making things with our hands, minds, and imaginations. So all forms of creativity, when they are channeled like this and they are rightly oriented as expressions of worship, they become that. Um, they become ways that we honor God and we can serve him through our creative means. It's one of the reasons why we have kind of struggled with um, the terms like Christian music or I'm a Christian painter, things like that. It's helpful in, like a, in the marketplace because it helps people find us and helps people know what kind of what our intentions are in the art that we make. Um, but I think what the way that we understand creativity is that there is no such thing as Christian music because music belongs to the Lord. There is no thing as, such thing as like Christian painting because visual arts belong to the Lord. <laughs> like, like I think like it's, it's Christian first and then it's other people who need to categorize it. <laughs> um, that it's the lost world who is searching for meaning and searching for this greater purpose that they pursue art 
and we realize, and we just want to shake him and be like, the thing you're looking for, it's expressed in the very art that you're making. It is God who has made all things beautiful and uh, has helped us to find these expressions. So, um, yeah, so that's just kind of nutshell. We could spend a lot more time, we could do a whole other class on creativity and the arts and God, but uh, just in this one subsection of what we look for in our quality of worship, uh, creativity plays a big part in it. That's why we encourage songwriting, we encourage um, journaling, all kinds of things that can help people find this creative, find and flex this creative muscle to the glory of God. Any questions on that before we move on? I'm sure it was brought up, um, but, you know, it it was not a level-headed time. So... (laughs) Uh, and one of the things I'm going to talk about, too, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology of worship. And I think that has played a part in sort of the settling down of worship wars. Because one of the things that it also became was a battle over volume, like the actual loudness of a service. And there's so much technology now that helps us play modern music at volumes that aren't, like, ear-bleeding, you know, like... When this was happening, there was no way to like, like Neil and I both play electric guitars, which were the, one of the most hated instruments <laughs> at one point in some Southern Baptist churches, but we do so without physical amplifiers on stage. Uh, and, you know, because that technology is available now. It was much more common because the, the musical education was different then. And so it was much more common for them to be able to read music. It's way less common for me to go into the youth room and find anyone that can read music. Uh, it's just not taught. And so there's, a, there's that difference as well of like, well, they would say, well, we want to open the hymnal and be able to see the melody. Well, ask any random sixth grader to open a hymnal and see the melody. They're like, well, what are you talking about? It's dots and lines. You know what I mean? Like it's, so there is a difference. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So there is, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot of cultural things that played into it. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our next point. Uh, unity. So we're going to talk about uh, unity and under that subheading, the preference and deference. And I decided to spend a whole week talking about this section. So maybe we blaze through this. Maybe it's a shorter class than usual. I don't know. But the reason why is if you get through this six weeks and you forget everything else I've said, remember this section. Uh, This is uh, one of the most important things that we're going to discuss for a lot of reasons, but this is the anti-worship wars <laughs> uh, section. This is how we exist at Buck Run. It's how I think all really healthy churches exist, and um, it's something that I had seen modeled before, but didn't really understand what was happening. I didn't understand how to put words behind what I was seeing and how we were existing in unity, and um, I think Mike Cosper, who wrote Rhythms of Grace, did a really good job of putting words behind what was really happening, the mechanics of this unity being preference and deference. So first of all, unity is to be desired. That's number one. We want to start there that um, it, this is, unity is something that we want in every church, and it's something that we thankfully really enjoy at Buck Run. Uh, Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Scripture has a lot to say about unity. Um, If you just Google (laughs) Bible verses on unity and then read whatever random generated list it gives you, um, there's a ton, which like sidebar, what what does everyone say about like, our America, American evangelicalism, the church at large, the country at large, it's, it's a divided time, right? You know what I mean? Like that's, right? <laughs> like that's like the one thing they're always like, oh, it's such a divided time. It's a divisive time. And we just, we're kind of okay with that for some reason. We've become used to operating in that when scripture is so clear over and over and over again that unity is to be desired. In fact, it's actually commanded uh, so we have, we have uh, allowed this sin of division because of 
political motivations, right? Because we don't want to back down on certain things. And we, what we don't realize is that you can achieve unity without abandoning principles. And that's part of what we're going to talk about. But scripture has a lot to say about unity. I'm just going to read a few here. Um, Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Uh, Philippians 2, 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Does that sound like a church that was deep in the throes of the worship wars? Like, it's not, that doesn't describe them well. Uh, Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Romans 14, 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Um, what a great verse to have in the back of your mind as you're building a theology of worship, right? Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That informs a lot of what we do when it comes to the worship ministry. We pursue peace and we want mutual upbuilding across the board. Um, I don't want to sing songs that are... Uh, going to be really encouraging for 10 people in a room of 600. Um, uh, this is for mutual upbuilding. And then Romans 15, 5 through 6 really gets at the heart of it. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying there, God wants to be worshipped with one harmonious voice. Um, that, that is the way it's designed to be. Uh, now, we've already talked about, like, we're fallen people, we're going to mess things up, but God will be glorified in spite of that, and God's glorified in divided churches every week. But if we're talking about what we're aiming for, what we're striving for, to be obedient, uh, we're striving for a unified voice, um, to glorify God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. No, that's four Corinthians. It's in the Apocrypha. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I don't put the period after that, I, f I forget to check it. It always changes core to four. Yeah, thanks for catching that. Second Corinthians. <laughs> Yeah. Pastors get access to different texts, you know. Yeah, it's a privileged thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, unity is not sameness. That's really important. Super important. Unity is not sameness. Diversity in style, genre, and instrumentation can exist in unity together. And that's kind of what I was talking about with Angelina and I's varying backgrounds they were not the same, but we express it in unity. We're, so much of our daily entertainment is built around the expression of those real particulars in our preferences and our opinions. And so, like, Twitter is about, like, giving a take on something. You have to have a take on everything. Uh, and if you don't have a take on everything, then you're not paying attention, and then you're falling behind, you know. Facebook is about, like, sharing the really specific uh, opinions on whether it's social issues, political issues, whatever. And so it's, our entertainment is built around how can I narrow in all of these preferences and these opinions, and, like, it puts you in little camps. And we're scrolling through that for six hours a day as entertainment. Um, and so... It's hard to shift gears then when you come to church. Like, it's hard to put that aside and be like, I'm supposed to dwell in unity here, even though I spent all week, like, figuring out how to pigeonhole myself into something much, much smaller. Um, because that's the way our, our, you know, social media rewards divisiveness. That's its whole purpose. It keeps you on the app longer. And so... It generates more revenue for them through ads. So it's all about, like, it's training us to, to pigeonhole ourselves. And then 
you come here and scripture's like, nope, that's not, that's not what you're for. That's not what you're, how you're meant to exist. We're meant to dwell in unity. But yeah, you're right. We can, we can do that by just saying like, oh yeah, no, agree to disagree. But we're, we can be unified. Right, exactly. On certain things, right. Yeah, we don't have any pastors here who are like, I don't believe Jesus was actually Lord. <laughs> and we're like, agree to disagree. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there are like levels to it, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yes, so unity is not sameness. We encourage diversity, um, and it's something that we enjoy and we should, we should take advantage of. So let's talk about preference and deference. We cannot worship two masters, God and preference. And we see this in the worship wars. The worship wars were an outburst of preference. Um, and to, uh, to take some of the blame off of the, uh, the stubborn older generation clenching their hymnals, uh, they, didn't, they didn't bring the preferences to the table, right? Uh, we challenged that preference with new music. And so uh, the gauntlet was not thrown down by a hymnal. <laughs> it, was, it was thrown down by this idea of like contemporary music. And I think there was good reasons to push for new things, but um, it was preferences that wouldn't budge that came to a head. And then kind of what I was talking about with social media, preference is modeled for us um, in every aspect of secular culture. Burger King, have it your way. You know what I mean? Like, it, we get to choose down to uh, the finest detail in every uh, area of the marketplace. Like, that's just the way that uh, our economy is built, and there's a lot of really great things about that. Um, but there's not much that we have to just sort of absorb um, that our preferences don't get to shape, right? Like, rent and, like, taxes, <laughs> you know, like, that's about it. Everything else, like, right, <laughs> the weather, and, <laughs> exactly, yeah, and even that, it's like, well, it's where do you live, you know, like, we live in a relatively moderate climate. Uh, there's a reason I don't live in Orlando. I would die, like, in the summer, like, right now, I would just be dead. It doesn't ha work for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there's preferences in that we get to exist, and part of that's just the privilege of living in a very free place, and we are thankful for that. Um, but we just have to remember that that's the way that we're being wired six days of the week, right? And so that obviously is going to disciple how we receive things when we come to church on a Sunday. Uh, we, sh we struggle to shed that mentality when we come to church. It's also important to know that a church fighting over worship style, and I'm talking specifically about the music here, is antithetical to church and to worship. Um, there's nothing churchy about fighting over worship. There's nothing worshipy about <laughs> fighting over worship. <laughs> worshipy is a word. I just made it one. Look it up. Um, but it's true because remember what are some of the tenets of worship that we talked about? Like it's built around humility and submission, and obedience, and those things cannot uh, exist with a haughty attitude towards your preferences. Uh, it's just antithetical. Uh, I cannot, if, let's just take off the pastor hat for a minute. Let's just assume that I'm just a normal church member, and I move to a new community. I can't go into a church and join and be like, hey, listen, um, I, I can't stand Phil Wickham. I can't stand him. I just, I don't like Phil Wickham. I don't want to sing any Phil Wickham songs. I think if you sing Phil Wickham, you're sinning, blah, 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 like laying all of that out and expect that that's going to somehow build up the church. Now, are there ways to express concerns to other church members and pastors? Of course there are. And please, if, I, if you ever see me do a heresy, just come and let me know. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, but I think coming in with this like haughty attitude of black and white, what is right and what is wrong, and when it comes to not even tertiary issues, 
whatever the area is for like seven. <laughs> um, but like coming in with those kind of issues and saying like, you know, we can only sing from this group, we cannot sing from this group, we can only sing from this time period, uh, things like that. That's not helpful for the church. Um, you have to come in with a little bit of grace. Lean not on your own understanding. Be not wise in your own eyes. Uh, and if you come in with that, uh, if that's, those proverbs are shaping how you respond to the worship, then that's going to make it a lot easier. And you'll find yourself worshiping the Lord through means that you have not before. And that's a good thing. That's a helpful thing. Um, preference itself is not sinful. We are not anti-preference. Um, our preferences help tell our story. They shape who we are. I am, love the fact that I am shaped by folk music and singer-songwriter and bluegrass and country music. That's just what I grew up with, and I love it. And I love that that informs the musical decisions that I make. Um, when I'm writing a worship song, uh, I have natural reflexes to go to the next chord because that chord progression has been played for me over and over and over again uh, from my childhood. You know what I mean? Like those things come out in my songwriting and they come out from, uh, for other people too. Uh, Neil is a great example. I'm going to call you out, Neil. <laughs> but, but Neil has a very different range of influences than I do, and it comes out in his playing in ways that I wouldn't be able to achieve. There's, there's notes and licks and progressions that are going to come out of Neil that I can't do, not just partly physically. I don't practice that much. But, but even, even if I did practice that much, I wouldn't make the same musical decisions because I have different influences. And so his preferences add something to our worship, just like my preferences do. And so preference itself is not bad. They tell who we are, where we come from, um, and they, they shape a lot, and they, they add seasoning to this gumbo that we're making on a Sunday morning. Um, our preferences are shaped by our history, our culture, our nostalgia, our desires, and our loves. And so those are all good things. Um, that's stuff that we want to encourage and we want to incorporate. It only becomes a problem uh, when the preferences become our idols. Untamed preference is self-indulgence leading to self-worship. So again, if I came in and said, we're only going to sing folksy acoustic-based worship music, that's a problem. And I wouldn't have this job probably if that was my thing, but, um, but that is a problem. And we don't come in with our preferences held up above our commitment to Christ. Because remember, we cannot worship anything which we esteem lower than ourselves. We also cannot worship anything which we esteem lower than our preferences. Um, if we hold our preferences high and Christ low, and our priorities are out of balance. And again, this is not talking about uh, sidestepping some of the core things that we've already talked about, right? There are some things that are not a matter of preference. They're a matter of doctrine, okay? And so I'm not talking about those things. So you don't get to come in and like, uh, like, I think we have doctrinal, biblical reasons why we don't do some of the things that you might see at other churches on Sunday mornings, and that's, that's okay. So there's, we, we ha hold those things first, and I'm talking on the broader sense of our preferences, things that shape our genres, our instruments, stuff like that. Um, so looking back at the worship wars again, as churches broke off into separate services or entirely separate churches, they became one-dimensional worshipers. Um, I can tell you the first, like, real past pastor, I can't say words today, pastoral position that I had uh, was leading a church that, like a lot of churches, the best solution they could come up with during the worship wars was to break off into different services. So they had three on Sunday morning that were genre specific. And I was the young guy, so of course I led the contemporary service. So there was traditional, 
at 8.15, contemporary at 9.30, and then blended at 11. Um, and spoiler alert. <laughs> right, yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. Blended, <laughs> blended just meant the funny thing was blended sang the same songs every Sunday morning as a traditional. They just had more people in the band. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it was you know it's it's really a misnomer. There's misnomers all the way across that. The biggest problem of that though is that um, what we're teaching that those congregations because really that's what we get, is we get three separate churches, right? They're in the same building, but they don't know each other. They, they don't see each other. Uh, is we get three separate congregations that are catered to on one genre, essentially, every Sunday, and never have to interact with other people outside of that. Um, and that's like a hardening of walls being built that don't need to be there, uh, and imagine, imagine, th- just think of someone who sits next to you regularly on a Sunday, and just imagine not getting to see that person every week because you like different songs. What a disgrace that is. Like, that's an embarrassment that you would lose that Christian fellowship with an entire group of believers over music. That's silly. And we, it's super common. You know, it happens all over the place. And, and I'm not judging the churches who made that decision. I understand that, like, we were just trying to figure out something. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm not trying to cast judgment on churches who have done that. I get it. And we were just trying to keep people in the same building. But uh, walls were put up that didn't need to be there. And people were divided, literally separated across three different services, sometimes more. Um, and I just, I want us to remember that when we worship together this morning, just look around the room and just think, who here would I pick to not be with today? Who here doesn't add to my church family that I'd be okay separating with so that I could sing more songs that I like? It's just, there's no one in there I would lose for that. It's not worth it. Absolutely not worth it. So the worship wars, uh, as they broke off, they left these churches isolated. I kind of already hit on this, I'm jumping ahead. But they left these churches isolated in an echo chamber of one group's preference, one group's preferences. And again, as we've talked about the value of preference, that's not something that's actually healthy, being isolated into one group's preferences. Um, Preference is then confused with correctness and eventually theological correctness. This is maybe the biggest danger of splitting churches up into different services, is then pastorally and congregationally, you are putting a lot of theological merit on one group's preferences. And that can be, I I don't think that's good shepherding. I don't, I think that's leading them to believe that there is more theological weight uh, than is actually there. Um, and it's hard to not think that the other people are doing something wrong. And so then if you're trained that way, or let's just say that maybe you're in a church that doesn't split across services, but is just very, very rigid about you know, music or whatever it is, then when you go to a different church that does things a little bit differently, it's like petting a cat the wrong direction. You're like, whoa, this feels wrong. Like, why does this feel weird? Like, they're singing Elevation this morning. Like, I heard that they're heretics. You know what I mean? Like, and you, like, you tense up, and you're like, what's going on? And that's because there's this, if we put too much congregational church credence behind our preferences, we start to think it's theological. We start to think that this is a, my preference is from God. (laughs) You know what I mean? Even though we ignore the fact that there are literally millions of Christians around the world worshiping completely differently in ways that would blow our minds and we would not be able to follow. Uh, But we come in thinking we have God's blessing on our preferences rather than just our cultural influences into them. So we never want to confuse our our preferences with theological correctness because When it is challenged, it can feel as if your God is under attack. And in a sense, it is because you have raised that above Christ. You have made that an idol. Um, And that's where we get into a problem. So that's preference. 
Let's talk about deference. And this is the key. We can honor God by deferring to the preferences of others. Um, what this practically looks like is we will not always sing the songs that we love the most. It's just, that's just true. Um, and, and I just want to say, just so you know, we don't sing the songs that I love the most, and I pick the songs, <laughs> right? Like, Sunday morning is not Adrian's Spotify playlist. Um, I would show you my Spotify, but it's pretty embarrassing, so I'm not. <laughs> but it definitely doesn't look like what we sing on Sunday morning. Now, are some of those songs in there? Absolutely. Um, but we pick songs, I pick songs that uh, I don't listen to throughout the week. Uh, we sing songs here that I had never heard before until coming to Buck Run. This morning, we're opening with uh, God is Able, which is a Hillsong song from 10 years ago, maybe. Um, and I had not heard it before I came here. I just It's one of those Hillsong records that kind of went under the radar for me. I never got into it. Uh, but it's been a staple at Buck Run for a long time. It means a lot to our people. Um, you guys have memories connected to it. Maybe you uh, remember the first time that Adam introduced it, and you remember um, an upcoming surgery that you had, or you remember the, how hard it was to get from our old property to this property and all the work that went into that, and you just remember God was able and he was with us, he never failed us. There's a lot of things. So culturally, to Buck Run, this song's important. So who am I to come in and say, well, I, I never really listened to that. I don't think we're going to sing that anymore. That would be a disservice to our church. And so even though that's not something that shows up on my Spotify every week, it's something I love singing with Buck Run because Buck Run loves that song because Buck Run remembers God's faithfulness through that song and you glorify God through that song. So that's significant to uh, our purposes here. Um, we will not always hear the sounds that we love the most. Again, this comes back to like our musical preferences, our instrumentation, things like that. Uh, you, uh, anytime you get a church this large, there's going to be a really wide array of backgrounds. And it can come from unsuspecting places. I have had young people come up to me and tell me, like young like high school students come up to me and tell me, the drums were too loud today. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like we pigeonhole like our seniors into thinking, and we think like, oh, if anyone, if Adrian gets negative feedback about like the volume being too loud, it's coming from that class, and that's not true. Like, you know, it's it's across the board, everyone's preferences. But like, I had people come up to me and be like, yeah, no, <laughs> no, positive as well. But like, yeah, like high schoolers were like, hey, the drums were like really, really loud, and. I receive that, and I'm like, hey, I, I get it. It's, it can be different. But that's because they're coming from a different background where that's not part of the sounds that they're used to hearing in worship. So we don't always hear the sounds that we want to hear the most. Uh, we might hear, you know, uh, a, a different arrangement of a hymn than what we're used to, even though it might be a hymn that we love, things like that. And the point is, all of that is okay, <laughs> Part of it is we just understand that so many people come from different places and are used to hearing different things. We don't sound anything like the church that I grew up in, and we don't sound anything like the church my wife grew up in. Um, we sound like Buck Run, you know what I mean? And we sound like the people who make up this church. And I think that should be the goal of every congregation, is to sound like your people. Um, We'll talk about this in the next couple of weeks, but there's been some great research done recently that was just published on the churches or the songs that SBC churches particularly sing. And what they found was that all large churches mostly sing the exact same songs. They're all trying to sound like they're from Australia. Uh, and, <laughs> and you don't have to sound like you're from Australia or from Redding, California. You know what I mean? Like you can, you need to sound like you are your people. If that includes singing songs from those places, great. But sound like your people. Sound like your church, because the church is 
a gathered body of believers. It's not a product. So in this, even though we don't hear the things that we want to hear the most, we will always honor the God we love the most. If he is above our preferences, and we can sometimes uh, defer to the preferences of others. Um, so yeah, there will be instrumentation, vocalization, music, musical expressions that we would not always choose, and that's okay. Mike Cosper says in Rhythms of Grace, grace makes the deference joyful. There should be a, a piece of you, um, if your spirit is aligned with the Holy Spirit and you're walking in obedience, there should be a piece of you that says, I am happy to lay aside this preference for the benefit of this congregation this morning knowing that at some point it's going to come back around. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm doing my job well, uh, at some point, that itch is going to be scratched, <laughs> right? Like, your preferences will swing back around if they are godly and right and fit within our context here. Um, and uh, there is joy in laying aside our preference, in deferring to the preferences of others. That is a way that we can uh, be a blessing to someone else. Uh, can someone find, uh, look up 1 Corinthians 10 and read for me t- verses 27 to 31. So this passage here about Christian decorum at dinners <laughs> is, a great in, is a great way to inform our worship and our worship practices. So what Paul is saying to the Corinthians here is there's this debate over whether or not we should eat food that was sacrificed to idols. So they, they would sell meat at a discount price because it was like, you know, Baal had to go at this first. <laughs> and, now, <laughs> like, and now you can have some. So maybe it sat out in the sun for a little bit. I don't know. But the point is, what Paul was saying is he was like, we know that that's not a God, right? Like we know that all they did was take really good lamb and put it in front of uh, a piece of wood that's shaped like something that doesn't exist. We know that, and so have at it. Save some money. Go eat some meat offered to idols. But if you go somewhere um, and someone sitting next to you is like, oh, don't eat that. That was food offered to idols. Then just say, okay, I won't eat it. You laying aside that preference, like even if it's a really good, juicy steak, just saying, for the conscience, for the sake of my brother's conscience, who's next to me, and watching me eat this, I'm not going to eat it. Uh, how, if, if we can, if Paul could instruct us to do that over something as significant as how we are going to find nutrition, because uh, this isn't like, they're not at Outback, he can't just order something else off the menu, right? This was sacrificial hospitality given to you by someone who's taking care of you. If you can lay that aside, how much more can you lay aside a song on a Sunday morning for the sake of your brother? Uh, you, we, we get to, we, we, we get this misunderstanding of Christian liberty. Um, when I was a teenager and like someone finally explained Christian, li- or started to explain Christian liberty to me, I thought like, oh my goodness, all the things I'm going to get to do as soon as I turn 18. Because I lived in a like strict household, and I was like, I've, I am free in Christ to watch R-rated movies. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like it's the joy is coming. Like, we're going to take this, and like, uh, I'm going to have like some really interesting, like, walk the line views on alcohol and moderation because Christian liberty. And like, you can run with it in all kinds of directions. What we misunderstand is the heart behind Christian liberty is not what can I get away with, it's what can I lay down for the sake of my brothers and sisters in Christ? What, can I, what preferences or activities, desires, can I lay at the feet of Jesus and say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's, I don't need to do this because it's going to benefit uh, someone in my church. And so we can expand that into some really secondary, primary issues of the faith, we definitely then can apply it to our musical preferences, to our church preferences, what we, uh, what the, 
worship pastor is wearing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like all kinds of stuff. Like we can, we can lay those aside. I'm just saying don't email me about my jeans, all right? <laughs> but, no, that's... <laughs> um, it's, right. Um, but we can lay those down. Uh, so deference must be taught and passed on. That's another important thing that's important for us to remember is that uh, we, you know, I'm a dad now, and obviously he's three, so he's not thinking about this. The entire world revolves around his preferences at the moment. But uh, as he gets older, I look forward to teaching him as we visit other churches on vacation or whatever it is. We're going to lay aside some preferences this morning. This is going to look different than how it looks at Buck Run because this is in our church, and we're going to worship in unity with these people so this is something we need to teach. It's something we are literally teaching our students. We, they went through the same class, and so we're teaching our students. Uh, get them while they're young to come in to hold their preferences lightly and be not just willing, but, excuse me, but eager to lay them down at the feet of Jesus for the benefit of their church. Yeah, like one of the... One of the uh, one of the downsides of like having really robust theology preached and like taught and demonstrated is uh, we've had some high school students like visit other churches or have like other bands come here to lead them. And they're like, yeah, I wouldn't have picked those songs like that, that they weren't theologically correct when they said this, this, or this. And like, you know, they're like adjusting their glasses and like, well, actually, and like, guys, calm down. Like, <laughs> I'm really glad that you value those things, but let's relax. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, preference and deference in practice. So, preference and deference in practice, obviously we're talking a lot about song selection. That's a huge part of it. We at Buck Run, we seek to sing diverse songs that appeal to the diverse preferences of the whole body. Um, and singing a song in a style that you do not prefer is an opportunity to hold the door and be a blessing. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so we come with thankfulness and with a willingness to let go of these things and to hold the door and to be a blessing. Uh, because we know that if we count others as more than ourselves, that is the way that we can be a blessing to them. And I think God blesses us in return through that endeavor. Uh, but none of these considerations trump our previously discussed criteria for congregational worship songs. So, again, we're talking about like way more uh, like tertiary issues about song selection rather than that like list that we went through is either week one or week two of what songs must do. We're actually, as, as much as I'm talking about preference and deference, we have, as I've shown you, like a pretty strict criteria of what will actually land in a worship order in part of our liturgy here at Buck Run. Um, but in that small pool, there is a lot of diversity still in style and era, and, you know, there's just a broad range that we represent here. Uh, we see it in our instrumentation. The instruments we play and the ways we play them will grow in diversity as our church grows in diversity. And uh, I don't just mean diversity as, like, ethnic diversity. That's certainly part of it, but uh, I, I mean more cultural diversity. Uh, we come, we are already culturally diverse in that we come from a lot of different cities, the countryside, <laughs> like, you know, we're bringing those influences with us, um, and with uh, the diversity in our age as well, right? Like, uh, I make musical decisions based on a lot of things I heard in the 90s, <laughs> and Keith makes musical decisions based on different, uh, you know, what, the 30s, 40s? <laughs> <just kidding>. uh, <laughs> No, but Keith is like heavily influenced by the 70s. He's like, he'll, he's proud of that. And I am thankful for that because that informs him and that adds richness to what we do here. A wide range of musical backgrounds and expressions are represented on the stage each week. That's, that's the point that I'm getting at and that's an important part. 
So real quickly, the last bit here is shepherding. How does this look from a pastoral role? I um, want you to know that from our perspective as your pastors, we understand that preference and deference, uh, they do not open the door for a free-for-all. This is not uh, in anything goes because, you know, we're going to lay aside our preferences or whatever. It is still carefully curated. Your pastors are called and equipped to shepherd us through a carefully curated worship ministry that reflects but is not directed by the preferences of the body. Um, what our collective preferences are is not the guiding factor of how we shape our worship. Because remember, we covered that at the very beginning, that we worship God as God intended to be worshiped. That's the guiding factor. And then how that breaks down as we get uh, deeper and deeper into the details, that's where you know, we start from that core point so that by the time we get to our preferences, they're already checked off because they're part of this larger, more important material. <laughs> that was, that's, that's Herschel's preference. That was, she's referencing the time that we briefly sang a verse of the monkeys, I'm a believer. It wasn't part of congregational worship. I want to say that. It was a sermon illustration. We did not encourage anyone to sing with us. Hard uh, asterisks on that. Um, we do not aim to please everyone, but to honor everyone. Uh, I will never in my life, no matter how long I do this, I will never make a set list on Sunday morning that makes everyone happy. I can't, it can't be done. It's been tried. The only way it can be done is if you break up into tiny genre-specific services and you cater to that one group and you keep other people out. And that's not our intention. We're to be together, and I will not make everyone happy, but I will do everything I can to honor them, to honor their preferences, where they come from, and their desires. So in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to cover some of that, uh, that survey that covers like what SBC churches are singing right now, and we're going to look at that. He broke it down in like really detailed charts, which is fascinating, and uh, I think it'll be cool for us to see how we actually differ from other churches our size based on some of that information, and we can break that down. Uh, we're going to address like the the one question everyone always wants to ask is, do you sing Bethel and Elevation? And do you have, how do you feel about songs coming from places that have different theology than you, et cetera, et cetera. We'll cover that and explain that um, and talk a little bit about the technology of worship and the, how that kind of plays into where we are. And then the last thing we're going to do is the same thing I did with the students last time we went through this is I'm going to have this class actually write the order of worship for the following Sunday. Um, and then I'm just going to take a Monday off because he did my job. <laughs> uh, but we're going we're gonna to write the liturgy together based on everything that we learn about song selection and our pool of songs and how we approach liturgy, et cetera.